revolt to lend it to him this time. In spite of all of that, he did not win. He did not win the UK general election. He didn't even come close to winning the UK general election. The gulf between the Labour Party and the Tory Party is still remarkable. So unless we genuinely believe that Jeremy Corbyn is going to be able to go further and win Conservative seats in England, then his route to government doesn't look very promising. And I say this knowing that at the minute, Jeremy Corbyn is on his way back from Stornoway in the Western Isles, where he's doing this mini Scottish tour that's being broadcast on the, on the media. And I do find this remarkable, actually, that this is the Labour strategy, because presumably what they think is available here is some sort of low-hanging political fruit in these SNP Labour marginals where they can go in and win seats off the SNP. But that is not the route to a Jeremy Corbyn government. It doesn't really matter if Labour took every seat off the SNP. Jeremy Corbyn still wouldn't have enough seats to become Prime Minister. The only way he can become Prime Minister is if the Labour Party recovers in England and begins winning seats off the Tories in all those parts of that country where they have lost them. That is the truth of the matter. So if anybody is pinning their hopes on Jeremy Corbyn, I think they're going to, they're going to be disappointed. And the other thing I think that we need to do in our response is always to accentuate our USP, our unique selling point. And that is the fact that we believe that this should be a self-governing country and we sh should be allowed to take a decision on becoming an independent country. And that, you know, we, we spent some of the last election saying, oh, this isn't about independence and it got confusing and then there was a triple lock and then it was about independence. And, you know, the, 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 shall I just say the message was unclear for large parts of the election campaign, which might have been a contributory factor in the result. But the truth is, if you're voting for the Scottish National Party, it's always going to be an expression of aspiration, an expression that you would like to support the idea of Scotland being its own independent country. There's no way away from that. No matter what election, if there's an election for the for community council and somebody standing as the SNP candidate and you decide to vote for him, that's part of the package. That is what we are, and we should never run away from it. Sometimes that vote will deliver a mandate that can be executed to achieve change. and some circumstances, it will not deliver a mandate because we will not be able to do anything at that particular point in time. But it will always be an expression of support for the idea. And here, this brings me to a, a key question. Some people will say that what happened on June the 8th, with support for the SNP slipping, with the Greens not standing and therefore not getting you know, much support neither, and with support for the Tories and what, and, and what, what apparently was a, a Unionist Labour Party rising, they might surmise, ah, oh, well, this is now a reversal for the independence campaign. This is a reversal for those who believe in self-government. Well, actually, it isn't. Because the polls, when you ask people, do they support Scottish independence? That remains relatively consistent at sort of low 42 to 46 percent all of the time over the last two years. The fact of the matter is that the principal party that advocates independence is now polling considerably lower than the number of people who say they support the idea. And that is the thing that people in my party, I think, need to address. So what do we do about this going forward? Well, before I get to that, I want to... Well, I think one of the things we had to do, as I said earlier, is I think we need to locate the campaign for Scottish self-government within the wider context of political reform in the British Isles. And that means we need to explain to people, not in Scotland, particularly we need to explain to people who would regard themselves as progressive or radical in England and in Wales and in Ireland, why what we are arguing for here would benefit all of the people that live in this part of the world. Before we do that, we need to confront two things, I think, which are suggested by these very same people. People who would regard themselves as uh, left-leaning, as, uh, you know, as liberal, as socialist, or, or whatever. People who, many of whom, write for The Guardian. There are two things that we need to confront. The first is this notion of solidarity. Because I don't know how often you've heard this from people from a labor or union background. But they say, oh, the working class in Glasgow and in Edinburgh have more in common with the working class in Liverpool and Manchester than they do with the uh, state owners and the ruling class 
in, 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 in Scotland. So, so th they shouldn't be supporting a, an independent Scotland because of that. Now, in one sense, that's a truism. Yes, of course, people who have nothing uh, but their labor to sell have got more in common with each other, no matter where they live, uh, than people who own and control the wealth in our society. But the working class of Glasgow and Edinburgh have got more in common with the working class of Marseille, of Milan, of Detroit, of Michigan, you get the idea, than they have with the people who rule their own country as well. And if you say that this communality of interest across the border is in itself a justification for maintaining the union of the United Kingdom, then what in fact you are saying is that that is the optimum political arrangement for advancing class interests within this part of the world. And my contention is that if that was ever true, it certainly isn't true anymore. In fact, I would argue that a potentially progressive reformist majority in Scotland is being held back by the fact that it is being attached to a much bigger conservative uh, majority in a larger country. And that if it were to disengage from that political arrangement, it could not only move forward and change things here and make things better, but it could be a catalyst for the rest of the country to see what is possible. Because there are many people in the, you know, and throughout all of England, you know, I'm thinking particularly in the, in, the, in the southeast, many, many people who, who look at what's happening in Scotland with some envy. They see the fact that our kids don't pay university fees. They see the fact we don't pay prescriptions, that we, you know, a lot of things appear to be better here, that care for the elderly or whatever, than, than what they are experiencing. They see that our health service well, has many problems, but it's not under the same intense constraint and pressure that the health service is in many parts of England. And they look at that with a degree of envy. And then the Daily Mail tells them, oh, well, the only reason they're getting that is because you're subsidizing them through your taxes. You're paying for it. Now, that's a lie. But the way to prove it's a lie is through having Scotland become an independent country and demonstrating that we can do these things simply by making political choices to do them and organizing our society in that way. And that would be a tremendously powerful message for people who aspire to that type of change in England as well. So we need to, contact, uh, con uh, we need to um, fight this, uh, this notion that solidarity somehow means that you cannot be expressed with Scotland becoming an independent country. In fact, we could probably, as a country, as a people, develop much more solidarity with the rest of the world where we free agents and able to act alone with our independent government. The second thing I think we need to discuss with some people on the English left, not all, but some people on the English left, is, is, what, is the N-word, okay? Because you would have seen this. I see it in the, in, in, in the Guardian from time to time. Some people writing, and they, they basically say that the, the campaign for independence, for Scottish independence, is a, first of all, it's a nationalist campaign, and secondly, nationalism is inherently divisive and negative and a bad thing. Now, neither of those things are true, and we need to say so quite loudly. The first thing to say is that the Yes campaign, indeed the SNP today, is made up of many different types of people, who, many of whom have different ideologies. There are socialists, social democrats, liberals, greens, people who just call themselves democrats, and nationalists. Of course there are. But it has never just been about one thing. It has been about a range of different political ideologies coming together, bound together by an arc that says the ultimate goal is that people should be allowed to decide these things in this country for themselves. And that is the overarching arc which brings us together, but we have many different perspectives on how that should be. I myself, I said before, I am not a nationalist. If you have to give me a, a label, call me a Republican Social Democrat. But I am happy to work with people who call themselves nationalists because here's the thing. As soon as you talk to any contemporary Scottish nationalist, assuming that we mean by nationalism that there is a national interest which transcends other interests and has to be advocated and defended. But as soon as you talk to anybody who calls himself a Scottish nationalist, you very quickly realize that what they are concerned about is not their wee bit hill and glen, but it's about the injustice and the inequality that is visited daily upon the people and the communities in which they live. So actually, 
the national interest becomes the public interest. And by national, we mean the people who live in the nation. And that is a wholly progressive and inclusive concept. And we have never, in the SNP or in the Yes movement, or anybody else who supports independence, we have never done anything other than say, it does not matter where you come from, what matters is that you're here, and we are going forward together. So for people who ought to know better, to try and associate our movement with the alt-right in America or the ethnic cleansers of Eastern Europe, and to suggest there is some continuum here because they're going to label all of these things nationalist, is not only wrong, it is intellectually dishonest, and it is offensive. So, having confronted those things, I think we need to look to the, the future. What would the timetable be? We know the, we know the referendum's on pause, so what's going to happen next? And I sense a lot of people, as I go around the country talking about this, they feel a sense of concern, of, of unease, not sure what happens next, are we losing ground, you know, what, how do we keep this thing going? Well, the truth of the matter is this, I think, that we have said that we need to see what happens with Brexit before we can decide whether or not that activates the mandate which we have in place from the 2016 general election to have another independence referendum conditional upon what happens in Brexit. So we need to see what happens. The truth is we won't know what happens until the late 2018, maybe even till 2019. And the truth also is you can't have a referendum the next day. We would have to schedule a campaign period and a build-up to it. So I can't see in that scenario any way practically where there could be a Scottish referendum before 2020. Oh, by the way, I should have said, there's a caveat to all of what comes next. And that is, this is what it looks now. It might be different next week. <laughs> okay? Because this last two years have been so politically turbulent. Things have happened so quickly and unexpectedly that, to be honest, we may have to react quickly, and I don't know. But, but from this pulpit tonight, just thinking ahead, the way I see it is that if we were to go and continue to link a Scottish referendum with the outcome of Brexit, I don't think that could even be organized before 2020. Now, here's the thing. By 2020, we will be on a countdown to the 2021 Scottish general election. So we have a choice, or at least a choice presents itself. Either we can try and activate another referendum on the question of Scottish independence on the heavily nuanced proposition that's conditional on the outcome of Brexit, and it is basically revisiting the question of 2014 to say that the options have changed, therefore we need to look at them again. Or we can go forward to the 2021 election and try and win a fresh mandate, which is unconditional on anything, and simply says, this is not a revote of 2014, this is a new vote on a new proposition because the world has changed and the opportunities for Scotland that flow from that change are also different than what they were before. And I believe that we can build a majority behind that second approach. But I know, and there will be people here and we will have questions in a minute, I know there will be people who are concerned about that. They will say, well, we could lose all this. You know, we might not win in 20, 2011. The Tories could win, who knows, right? The whole thing might just be dead. Well, it might be. It might be, of course. But I say to you, have courage in your conviction. Because the truth is this. If we can't win the general election, and by we now I mean a range of pro-independence parties, if we cannot win a majority in the 2021 Scottish general election under a system of proportional, relevant, of proportional representation, which more or less allocates seats according to the votes cast, then we will not be able to win a Scottish referendum the year before anyway, especially if it is conditioned upon a set of conditions and outcomes that people really aren't sure about. So therefore, I think the strategy now is to go and have a plan that comes back from 2021 and looks to secure a majority so that we go forward to have another referendum, not a second referendum, a completely new referendum with a new set of circumstances simply because the world has changed and the passage of time has taken place, and it is legitimate to ask the question again because so many people want to do so. And I believe that is the strategy that we should take. I should stress 
<laughs> I'm not here as a party spokesperson. I'm here trying to throw out some ideas for discussion. 